So we we are very pleased to have Shil Ganatra from USC, and he's gonna talk. He's gonna tell us about categorical non-properness in wrapped floor theory. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for the invitation to speak here. Um, it's great pleasure to be here, and great to see many of you, and to see many of you in this time zone. So I. Uh, want to tell you today about some non-finiteness or non-properness phenomena that we frequently see in Rapfler homology. And the main goal of today is to tell you that actually, in fact, to a large part, these non-properness phenomena that we've been seeing in lots of examples are a necessary consequence of global categorical and or topological field theoretic structures, okay? Um, and, and, and structural results that we have to date. Okay, so to set the stage, I want to remind you what sorts of invariance I'm dealing with. So I'm dealing with wrapped floor theory. So um, to talk about this phenomenon, I'll start with um, my setting. I'm working with exact symplectic manifolds, specifically Liouville manifolds. These are manifolds uh, which are modeled on the symplectization of a contact manifold near infinity. Um, I'm assuming positive dimension, so Liouville manifolds are actually non-compact genuinely. That's important. Uh, and wrapped floor theory associates, for instance, a closed string and an open string invariant. The closed string invariant is symplectic cohomology. It's a version of Hamiltonian floor homology. Uh, and uh, I'm just gonna treat it as a black box for most of this talk. Um, it might be helpful at some point to realize that symplectic cohomology, it's, you can set it up as the cohomology of a chain complex generated by cochains of the manifold and some contributions coming from Rabe orbits. There's a copy of chains in a circle for every Rabe orbit um, at infinity. This is a Rabe orbit. Um, of the contact boundary at infinity. Um, and on the open string side, we have the Rap Fukai category. Its objects um, are exact Lagrangians, properly embedded, but they could be non compact. They have to be cylindrical at infinity. Uh, the morphisms, at least cohomologically, are wrapped Fleur homology. And you can think of these as limiting Fleur homologies of the wrapping of one Lagrangian um, in the positive Rabe direction near infinity with another, you take the direct limit. Uh, you could also arrange, by the way, that wrapped Fleur homology is built out of the ordinary Fleur cohomology, the intersection Fleur cohomology. Uh, you could think, again, if K is L, you can set this up so that this is just cochains on K, plus Rabe chords, contributions from Rabe chords between the Legendrian boundaries at infinity. Okay, so just staring at the complexes, the presence of these chords orbits means that symplectic cohomology and wrapped floor homology could be infinite dimensional, but it doesn't force infinite dimensionality. You know, so, uh, so if it were just cochains or, um, you know, of course it has to be finite dimensional, uh, but there could be infinitely many Rabe orbits or Rabe chords. Um, However, even if there are, they may not contribute to homology. So even if there were infinitely many Rabe orbits or Rabe chords, which we don't know in general, the relevant homology group doesn't have to be infinite dimensional. Differentials could cancel everything. The group could be zero. We see that in many examples. Um, it could possibly even be finite dimensional a priori from this definition. Okay, uh, and um, of course, if you see in examples, you'll see many cases where things are infinite dimensional. Uh, I just threw up an example here that I'm not going to spend time on. It's uh, everyone's favorite first computation of wrapped floor homology. If you take the cotangent bundle of S1 and you take a cotangent fiber, the wrapped floor homology of this, you rapidly see as you start to wrap in the positive rape direction, uh, the cotangent fiber, you pick up an integer's worth of intersection points. None of them cancel. As an algebra, you get Laurent polynomials. Um, Okay, but on the other hand, this infiniteness persists in many cases on Liouville manifolds. In fact, to my knowledge, in all known computations on Liouville manifolds, um, symplectic cohomology appears to be either zero or infinite rank. Uh, and for a non-compact connected Lagrangian, wrapped floor homology, um, in all known examples, to my knowledge, is either zero or infinite rank. Now, I should mention um, we have lots of computations at this point. So we have numerous computations of these floor theory groups. We have now a, quite a bit of structural toolkit for computing these things, mostly on Weinstein manifolds, actually entirely on Weinstein manifolds in the exact setting at this point. Weinstein manifolds are Liouville manifolds for which the Liouville vector field is gradient-like for a Morse exhaustion function. 
Okay, now outside of the case that uh, we look at self rapfler homology, sometimes, um, or outside of the case L is compact, sometimes things, things can be finite. So for instance, if KRL is compact, or more generally, KRL are non compact, but the Legendrian boundaries lie on different components, then there are no ray chords at infinity at all. So HW equals ordinary HF, which is finite dimensional, could be non zero. So here's an example you look at the four punctured sphere, you look at um, two different Lagrangians that go between two of the boundary punctures, different boundary punctures, you see that there's no interesting red chords appearing, wrap floor homology is one dimensional. So, um, so things could be finite, but nevertheless, these wrap floor homology groups are frequently infinite uh, when they can be. So um, it's an old folk question, which I learned in graduate school, um, that must these infinite or zero phenomena hold? Okay, so I mean this one and that one. Uh, I'm not sure this is expected to be or believed to be true in this level of generality. I mean, it sort of could be the case by accident that, you know, floor differentials cancel out everything but finitely many um, cohomology. Um, but let me make some remarks about it. Uh, so, so first of all, of course, case A about symplectic cohomology is the special case um, of L equals diagonal of case B. So so B is a more um, general thing in some sense. Uh, in fact, at this point, to my knowledge, it's unknown for every cotangent bundle, where at least assuming Q is spin, uh, we have an isomorphism with free loop homology, um, that this is always infinite. Um, so this question is poking at something somewhat hard in general. Um, oh, by the way, I should add, um, I'm not seeing the chat, so um, feel free to jump in and ask a question. I welcome that. just want to say that. Um, another sense that this is poking at something hard or, or could be untrue is that, well, if this infinite or zero phenomenon held, then the acceleration map, uh, which from ordinary cohomology to symplectic cohomology, which you can think of as inclusion of a subcomplex in the model above, um, can't be an isomorphism. And this is a form of what's called the algebraic Weinstein conjecture introduced by Viterbo. And this of course Im implies uh, the usual Weinstein conjecture on the existence of a ray orbit at infinity, uh, which in this level of generality is unknown. So uh, again, this seems to indicate that this alternative um, is circling something difficult or, or might not be true. Um, on the other hand, maybe I just want to draw example, uh, your attention to one non-exact case. It's known that in the non-exact case, this alternative definitely fails in general. Okay, so there are computations uh, on negative line bundles uh, by Ritter and Ritter-Smith of, uh, this is a class of monotone, non-exact, non-compact symplectic manifolds, where symplectic cohomology is finite non-zero and similarly for Rapfler homology. And in fact, the Rapfukai category is really nice. It's smooth and proper. Um, so um, whatever's going on, you know, something interesting is going on because we haven't found an exact example where, you know, there aren't, you know, where things aren't completely zero or there isn't some infiniteness, but this fails in the non-exact setting, just in known examples. So um, it, it seems unclear whether, uh, or maybe hard, whether these alternatives hold, but the main result that I want to share with you today is that a more global version of this infinite or zero phenomenon holds in rather broad generality in the exact setting. Okay, so here's the theorem. Uh, this is a theorem in preparation. Um, so the theorem um, says, and I'll explain all the terms as we go. Uh, so let X be a non-degenerate Mugel manifold. So non-degenerate is a hypothesis I'm going to put on its FLIR theory. Um, which is known for any Weinstein manifolds. And I'll, I'll insert some decorations here. Um, and let's assume it's dimension greater than zero, so it's actually non-compact. Uh, then the following alternatives do hold. Okay? Uh, the rapp fukai category of X is either zero or non-proper. Okay? Uh, more generally, any quotient of the rapp fukai category is either zero or non-proper. Um, that's statement one and one prime, one prime slightly stronger. Uh, and then statement two is we can get slightly more local. We can talk about a single Lagrangian. Like you might wonder, what about a single Lagrangian? And so the statement two says that any Lagrangian in L, um, if if it's 
non-compact and, and meaning all of its components are non-compact, then it's also either zero or so-called both left and right non-proper. And the same is true for any sum end of such an object in, um, in the split closed pre-triangulated closure of the Raffaecai category. So, okay, let me make some definitions. So first of all, what is non-degenerate mean? That's a hypothesis we're, we're putting on this Fukai category. So non-degenerate. Improving... Uh, Go ahead. Uh, does this mean yes. that you're proving the Weinstein conjecture for all Weinstein fillable contact structures? No, I'm I'm not. No, 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 no. So so to clarify, um, I'm this does not prove that symplectic cohomology is zero or infinite. Okay, so this is a weaker statement. So it's uh, it's, it's a statement about the whole rat Fukai category. Um, so I'll, I'll explain maybe the difference. So, so it, it, it does not mean that as far as I'm aware. Um, but thanks for the question. Okay, so non-degenerate means uh, there, I, the definition isn't too important but it, for what I'll say, but it means there exists some collection of Lagrangians satisfying Abu Zayed's so-called generation criterion. And um, recent structural results say, in fact, that any Weinstein manifold, which, are, which is where we've done you know, all the computations. Uh, let's see if I can, um, one second here. Okay, um, so a, a recent series of results say that all Weinstein manifolds are non-degenerate. So, so this applies to all Weinstein manifolds. Uh, let me tell you what proper means in this instance. Uh, so I'll just skip ahead for a second. Uh, so let's just work over a field for simplicity. Um, although the results um, are true over, for instance, the integers. Um, so I'm gonna use the terminology that mod K is the category of all chain complexes over K. And perf K is the category of chain complexes which are perfect K modules, which means they are cohomologically finite. That means they have total cohomology finite dimensional. Um, so with that in notation introduced, we say a category is proper if all of its morphism spaces are perfect K modules, meaning they all are cohomologically finite for every X and Y. And an object in C, is right respectively left proper if all homs into L, respectively all homs from L, always produce perfect complexes, i.e. things with cohomological finiteness. Uh, so to unpack what statement one is saying, okay, uh, statement one um, is saying that, let's see if I can, So statement one is saying that if the rap Fukai category is non-zero, then there exists a pair of Lagrangians whose rap fleur homology is infinite rank, okay? Uh, it's not true for every pair, but there exists a pair. Uh, but they're also including, because uh, all these are Morita invariant properties, non-proper is Morita invariant. So it's true if you pass to any split generating subcategory. So in particular, in any split generating set, there has to be such a pair with infinite rank rap fleur homology. Um, so if you have a split generating collection, for instance, co-cores of a Weinstein presentation, then the self rap floor homology of the union of all the co-cores must be zero or infinity. So you get the alternative for um, the sum of all the generating sets, okay? Um, so one prime uh, says something a little bit stronger. So for instance, it excludes the possibility, uh, let's see, that the rat Fukai category has some piece that happens to be proper that doesn't talk to anything else, right? So it just says, you know, there really can't be any, anything else that behaves in a proper fashion. Um, statement two, uh, let's see, what does statement two says, say? It says, if you have a given non-compact Lagrangian and it's non-zero, then it has to have infinite floor homology um, with some Lagrangian in both directions, okay? So there has to exist a K with HW LK's infinite rank, and there has to exist a K prime with HW K prime L infinite rank. And there has to exist one such K and K prime in any generating set, okay? Um, 
So maybe I'll make one remark about two versus one. Actually, a priori, um, I'm stating them separately, but you, you can think of two as, in some sense, strictly stronger than one. So uh, here's kind of a thought exercise. So let's say you um, have a Rafukai category that's generated by a collection of objects with each object non-compact. For instance, this is true for co-cores of a Weinstein presentation by the works I've mentioned previously. Um, let's as assume, let's throw out all those co-cores which are zero objects, okay? So let's, let me assume that, you know, if the Rafukai category is zero, then the K, the number of generators is just zero because I've thrown out all the non-zero, all the zero objects. Then if the Rafukai category is, is a non-zero category, um, Statement one says that some wrap floor homology from some cocore i to some cocore j has to be infinite rank, whereas statement two says that at least k of these groups hw of cocore i with cocore j have to be infinite rank, uh, and in fact there has to be at least one for each i and for each j. So for each cocore delta i, I can find some infinite rank floor homology from it and some to it. Okay. Um, nevertheless, I, I tend to think of these as sort of uh, I, I, it's, I think it's nice to state them different, separately because you know the proofs. Um, you can prove one, you know, slightly differently than two, and it, it seems like it might be useful to have that different statement with different proof. Okay, so um, how do the proofs go? Actually, the proofs appeal to the structure and properties of TQT operations, uh, in particular. I want to highlight the role um, played by a co-pairing. And the fact that it's degenerate, I'll say a word about, I'll say much more about that. Um, and, and how these play with the fact that the Rafukai category is a smooth Calabiao category, which is a, a theorem I proved in my thesis, assuming precisely these hypotheses. Okay, so um, to, to talk about this a little bit further, uh, let's just recall that um, these groups, symplectic cohomology and let's say wrap floor homology of LL uh, for simplicity, they admit various 2D TQFT operations as is very common in floor theory by counting solutions, um, you know, um, to maps from a certain surface with many inputs and many outputs. So in particular, if I have a surface with N1 inputs and N2 outputs, I get an operation from my group tensor N1 to my group tensor N2. Maybe there's some degree shift. I won't worry about that right now. And similarly in this Lagrangian Fleur case. Um, so uh, the, most, the most notable operations for this purpose, uh, a cylinder contributes to identity. There's this pair of pants, gives a product well-known. The cap gives a unit. And this structure, which I'm gonna just call a macaroni with two outputs, gives a co-pairing, uh, which is an element of symplectic homology tensor two, or wrap floor homology, if I'm if I use this sort of open string co-pairing, um, and it's a it gives you a finite you know it's it's an element of that meaning it's a finite sum of the form sum of ai tensor bi. Okay, now we're in a non-compact setting, and the reflection of that is, in fact, not all such operations appear in practice. So if you look at say Ritter's paper, which constructs um, all these operations in this setting, uh, you see this restriction that the number of outputs for any such operation has to be greater than or equal to one. And um, there are technical problems in um, which experts see as a failure of maximum principle in setting up, for instance, a pairing. Um, but these technical problems reflect a more fundamental point, uh, which is that if there existed a compatible pairing, uh, let's say P, and we'll represent that by a, a macaroni with two inputs and no output, well, then then a, a standard relation in topological field theory would imply quite a bit, which we know not to be true in this case. So the snake relation in TQFT would imply that, well, the identity can be decomposed in terms of the co-pairing and pairing. And if you just directly unwind what that means, uh, this says that, well, um, a given element of symplectic homology equals identity of V equals P tensor identity of V tensor the co-pairing. I'm gonna call the co-pairing C often in this. Uh, paper and uh, in this talk. And so C, well, C is some finite sum. Therefore, we see that V equals some sum, some finite sum of the form V paired with AI times BI, which means BI is a basis. So the group would have to be finite dimensional. 
And moreover, the maps um, induced by the pairing, uh, which I'll call P upper star from SH to SH star, and the map induced by the co-pairing from SH star to SH are both inverse. Okay, so in particular, if there was a pairing, the group would be finite dimensional and non, oh, I lost my spot here. The group would be finite dimensional and the co-pairing would be non-degenerate in the sense that the map the co-pairing induces from SH dual to SH uh, given by sending a functional to functional tensor identity applied to co-pairing would be non-degenerate. Uh, sorry, was there a question? I'll just, thought I heard something. Yeah, this Okay, so so the first idea um, is that well, you can try to more precisely obstruct the existence of a pairing um, by setting the failure of the co-pairing to be non-degenerate, meaning the induced map C star from SH dual to SH, you want to study its failure to be an isomorphism, okay? So we're going to try to obstruct finite dimensionality by obstructing the existence of a pairing, okay? Uh, by, studying, by, by studying the failure of C upper star to be an isomorphism. Equivalently, uh, the failure of this cone complex, the cone of C upper star on the chain level to be zero on homology, okay? Um, so, Maybe one remark um, about this cone complex. This cone complex is a familiar entity in symplectic geometry. If you just think of, if you just Poincaré dually identify the dual of symplectic cohomology with symplectic homology on the chain level, this cone complex is nothing but the Rabinovitz Fleur homology. Okay, so we want to study, you know, um, whether Rabinovitz floor homology necessarily needs to be non-zero or whether it could be zero. Okay, so um, the key observation is actually an old one and it's been, it's been in the literature for a while. It's a result of Ritter's. Um, there is an obstruction in, for Liouville manifolds in complete generality um, when symplectic cohomology is non-vanishing for this co-pairing to be non-degenerate, okay? So here's a theorem of Ritter's. Um, I'm going to call it, for the purpose of this talk, uh, the degeneracy lemma. Okay, and I maybe, um, I want to point, point out that in Ritter's original paper, this theorem is stated as, um, as sh of x equals zero if and only if rfh of x equals zero for a level manifold. Okay, but I'm going to state it a little bit different. Okay, so the, the statement is that for a level manifold, the image of C upper star from the dual of symplectic cohomology to symplectic cohomology lands in the collection of nilpotent elements with respect to the cup product. Okay. Um, Therefore, it can only be an isomorphism if the unit is nilpotent, which can only happen if everything vanishes. Okay, so so that's the obstruction. Um, the same property, by the way, holds for the co-pairing on Rapfler homology, with the same proof, assuming L is exact and each component is non-compact. So you'll see directly where this non-compactness appears. We're going to use it in a very key way here. Okay, so here's the sketch of Ritter's argument. Um, so. In this TQFT structure, one sees that there's actually freedom. There's more freedom than uh, it first appears. There's freedom to degenerate or pinch surfaces appearing in various counts, provided each component of the degeneration has at least one output. So you can take the co-pairing and pinch it like this, and you can analyze what that means um, for things to come from constant loops. It tells you that the co-pairing, in fact, factors through what I'd call the topological co-pairing. So the topological co-pairing you could think of as a map from K to cohomology, tensor cohomology, which then accelerates to symplectic cohomology. And this map is just uh, sends one to the diagonal lower shriek of one. Okay, so it's the, it's the wrong way map for the diagonal embedding. Okay, so this tells you that C upper star, the map from SH dual to SH, factors as um, by a map 
first from SH upper star to cohomology upper star, then that maps to cohomology by the topological co-pairing, then that accelerates the symplectic cohomology. So let's Sorry. analyze that a little further. Go ahead, go ahead, question, yes, please. Yes, just to make sure I follow, a K the field here, is it the, say, R versus, like, well, is it, is it, is it the, under, like the underlying field R or is it like a Novikov field? No, um, so in the exact setting, everything, everything, I, I'm just assuming you have an arbitrary field. So, so K could be, um, you know, Z mod PZ, it could be rationals, it could be complex numbers, things like that. Do you add Novikov coefficients to that? I, I'm, I'm asking because earlier you said you could take K to be a ring as well. And then the question is... Ah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm not adding Novikov coefficients right now. I'm counting everything weighted by one. So in the exact setting, those are all finite counts. So it's... Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I also have a question. Uh, I yeah, please. How, uh, why does this pinching uh, argument imply that C factors through the co-homology, tensor co uh, you can, I mean, uh, you can go further with this pinching argument, right? So you can, you can further, you know, sort of, you know, apply this usual, you can turn this into like some sort of Morse picture, uh, right? And the, so the, the rough sketch is to sort of pinch and then you sort of stretch out a Morse flow line and so on yeah. and so forth. Maybe I, maybe I won't say much more about that, but, um, but this, this thing is the topological co-product right here, uh, suitably counted. Um, okay, so uh, thanks for the questions. So of course, um, cohomology dual is, is just Poincaré dual to compactly supported cohomology. And this co-product map from the dual of cohomology to cohomology is just the canonical map from compactly supported to ordinary cohomology. Okay, um, the key here is that this canonical map uh, is zero in cohomological degree zero, okay, when X is non-compact. Okay, so the first part of the argument is that that map is zero in, in cohomological degree zero because every component of X is non-compact, zero with compactly supported cohomology is zero. Uh, therefore, it lands in nilpotent elements. It lands in positive cohomological degree elements. They're nilpotent for the cup product. Okay. Um, the second fact is that acceleration, let's see if this will fit here. Acceleration is an algebra map between the cup product and the pair of pants product. Therefore, it preserves nilpotence. Okay. So if, if something is nilpotent in ordinary cohomology, it's nilpotent in symplectic cohomology. Um, now, I want to point out that at this, this is the stage at which we've used exactness, because um, if X is non-compact, this map is not an algebra map for ordinary cup product. Okay, so this, um, maybe I'll just say right here, um, this could break if um, X is uh, non-exact. Okay, acceleration is then an algebra map for the quantum product, okay, right? And that's in the non-exact setting where things might go wrong because a quantum product need not preserve the nilpotence condition for positive degree cohomology classes. Quantum product could lower degree if there are positive churn spheres, okay? So, okay, so this is the degeneracy lemma and here's, um, here's how I'd like to use it. So let's pretend for a moment that we knew uh, the following implication. Let's pretend we know that if symplectic cohomology is finite dimensional, then it has a pairing compatible with the co-pairing that fits into a snake relation. Okay, so we know the reverse implication, but let's say we knew this. Well, then what would we, what would we learn? We would learn that if SH is finite dimensional, then by this hypothetical, you know, hypothet hypothetical implication, it has a pairing. Then by the snake relation, the co-pairing is non-degenerate. Then by the degeneracy lemma, that can only happen if symplectic cohomology is zero, okay? So that would actually prove the zero or infinity alternative. Um, that we've proven if it's finite dimensional, it's zero, okay? Uh, similar argument would then work for wrap floor cohomology. Um, so now we can try to turn to, does this hypothetical um, 
assumption holds? Well, I actually don't know any good reason that it should hold, um, which is where this argument breaks. Um, however, it turns out that such an argument just works, provided you assume some stronger finiteness hypotheses, um, which is the main observation, which leads to the theorem. Okay, so, so the proof, let's recall the statement of the theorem. The statement of the theorem um, says, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on one and two, uh, sorry, one and two here, uh, that the rat Fukai category is either zero or non-proper under these hypotheses. And any object that's non-compact and every component is non-compact is either zero or non-proper. So what we'll, what we'll prove, um, so here's the sketch of proof. Let's suppose the rat Fukai category or an object in it is a proper object. Okay. Uh, and the rap, and the manifold is non-degenerate as I, as I said, we needed. Uh, then what we'll show is there necessarily has to be a pairing fitting into the snake relation with the existing co-pairings. Okay. So if you know that, then you learn that the co-pairing is perfect by the snake relation, um, which implies by the degeneracy lemma. that symplectic cohomology, respectively Rapfler homology of L has to equal zero. Um, and well, if symplectic cohomology equals zero, it's well known that the Rap Fukai category equals zero as well, because uh, you know, H, HW of LL is a unital module over SH. Uh, and, uh, or if HW of LL is zero, then L is zero. Okay, so that's, that shows that properness implies vanishing, supposing you know this construction of a pairing. Uh, and, and to prove the stronger statements about, oh, you know, no localization or some end can be, you know, can be proper unless it's zero, what you do is you translate this degeneracy lemma that I talked about above into some algebraic property of the rat Fukai category or of a, an object in it, which localizes well and or in, is inherited by some ends and implies non-properness or zero for any localization or some end. Okay, so that's, that's the sketch of the argument modulo this key detail, construction of a pairing. So maybe I'll pause for a second and see if there are any questions about the outline. And then I'll, what I wanna do for the rest of the time is talk about why these pairings exist and just make a few other comments. I'll just pause for a minute here. Okay, so, so I'm gonna talk about the pairing on symplectic cohomology and then wrap floor homology one at a time. So, so I'll call the, the construction of the pairing on symplectic cohomology under these finiteness hypotheses one, and then the one on wrap floor cohomology under the finiteness hypotheses on L two. Okay, so let's talk about one. Um, so we're gonna transfer the existence of a pairing um, to Hochschild homology of the wrap Fukai category. Okay. Um, by, the, by the following standard thing. So under the given hypotheses, uh, there is an open closed isomorphism um, between the Hochschild homology of the Rapp-Fukai category and symplectic homology. And moreover, the Rapp-Fukai category is what's called a smooth Calabi-Yau category. I'll say more about what that means in a minute. It's a type of duality. And these were, these were statements from my thesis. Um, okay, so, so what is smooth Calabi-Yau? Well, I'll just briefly indicate what it is, and I'll say more about what it is later. Um, let's see if I have something to say. Okay, so for now, we can think of smooth Calabi-Yau as some sort of Poincaré duality condition that uh, it's, it's akin to having a holomorphic volume form inducing a cat product duality in, in the Hochschild theory of this category. So I'll, I'll, I'll say more about that uh, later. Uh, now for a smooth category, smoothness is a finiteness condition uh, that maybe I should define. And it's known to hold under these hypotheses. So there's a, and under these smoothness hypotheses, there's a purely algebraic construction of a co-pairing um, in HH lower star of C, tensor HH lower star of C for any smooth category, okay? And this co-pairing will algebraically play the role of the geometric co-pairing on symplectic cohomology. Um, 
Okay, and, and why, why can it do that? Well, uh, work of Simon Reshikov in preparation shows that in fact, this open closed map sends this purely algebraically constructed co-pairing to the one on symplectic cohomology, okay? So we may as well think in terms of this algebraic co-pairing. Okay, so let me say a word about how that's defined. The, the definition of this co-pairing is due to Shklarov. Um, so a category smooth, if it's diagonal bimodule is a perfect bimodule, meaning it is split generated by Yoneda bimodules, okay? Um, now, any object of any category, X and D, induces an element called the churn character of X uh, in Hochschild homology of D, okay? Um, so smoothness therefore tells us that we can take the churn character of the diagonal bimodule. Um, since the diagonal bimodule is perfect, this gives an element of Hochschild homology of perfect bimodules. By Merida invariance, Hochschild homology of perfect bimodules is nothing but the tensor of Hochschild homologies of W with itself. This gives you the co-pairing. Now, Shklarov did quite a bit more. In fact, he also shows that if a category is proper in the sense that all of its cohomological morphisms are finite, there exists a pairing fitting into a snake relation with the co-pairing. Okay, and um, so in fact, we're, we're already done because that's, that's the fact we needed in order to deduce this non-properness or zero. We just needed the construction of a pairing fitting into a snake relation with the co-pairing. Okay, so it fits into a snake relation with the co-pairing, um, this algebraic co-pairing but that algebraic co-pairing can be equated with the symplectic cohomology co-pairing. Uh, maybe I'll say, uh, is there a question? Sorry, I, maybe I'll say a word about how to construct this pairing as well. Okay, so you can think of this pairing as some sort of categorical form of wedge, wedge and integrate. Um, so all you do is you sort of um, note that if you have a proper category, then HOM takes values in perfect K modules, as we've mentioned. Um, so now you think of HOM as a bilinear functor from your category op tends to your category to perfect modules, and you look at its push forward on Hochschild homology. This gives you a map from Hochschild homology of W op, uh, which by the way is the same as Hochschild homology of W, tensor Hochschild homology of W to Hochschild homology of perf K, but Hochschild homology of perf K is just K. Um, by the way, this only works if your HOM takes values in perfect complexes because Hochschild homology of all chain complexes is zero. So you don't get an element K out. Um, so this already sort of handles the first part of the theorem. Uh, we can do further, we can do a little bit more, um, which uh, which is we can translate this degeneracy property into a purely categorical statement about the rap fukai category, okay? But to do that, you need, um, you need to identify two different types of Hochschild invariance. Uh, you need to identify Hochschild homology, which is sort of some algebraic homology theory for this category. Um, that um, is where the co-pairing lives. And Hochschild cohomology um, is a ring with unit, uh, which is a place where you can talk about nilpotence. Okay. So uh, now fortunately, Calabiao structures, whatever they are, uh, precisely introduce, you know, induce this type of cap product duality between these two. So you can translate this degeneracy lemma of Ritter's now into a purely categorical statement that if you take the algebraic co-pairing on the rap category and compose with this isomorphism to Hochschild cohomology, you get nil, you have nilpotent image, okay? So um, this statement alone, you, you can now move away from symplectic cohomology. This statement alone implies non-properness or zero, but it also persists under quotients and implies all quotients are non-proper or zero. So, so why exactly it does imply this property about quotients? Um, that's, a, that's a series of technical lemmas. I mean, that's, that's maybe, um, why does it persist under quotients? Um, I can say a word about that, I guess. So, um, so it's, it's sort of well known, basically. Um, so if C is smooth, 
and c to d is a quotient functor, um, the first observation is that, so of course there's a push forward on Hochschild homology. Hochschild homology is covariantly functorial. Um, and this push forward actually sends the co-pairing to the co-pairing. That's the first thing to say. Okay. Um, this is, this is not necessarily true if you don't have a quotient functor or something like it. Um, so uh, I, I think that's kind of the main observation. And once you know the co-pairing comes from somewhere, then you can, you can play the same game that was used in the degeneracy lemma. The degeneracy lemma, if you know the co-pairing, then, then you get a factoring, right? Like okay, this. That's the co-pairing. Yeah. Right? Exactly. And the point here is that the push forward on bimodules for a localization sends the diagonal to the diagonal. That's a property of localizations. In fact, that's all you need about this. Sheila, is, is it uh, sort of uh, nilpotent or uniformly nilpotent or? Um, uh, nilpotent, uh, it's, sorry, like can is, you ask the question again, Chris? Uh, is, is there, is it uniformly nilpotent uh, or is it clear that it's ah. not? Uh, it's, it's not clear to me. Whether whether it's uniform completely from this point of view, um, uh, probably actually from symplectic cohomology, from the ordinary cohomology point of view, if you're a Weinstein manifold, there's there's probably you know it's probably uniform, right? You, you know since you're working with positive degree cohomology classes, you know that if you take at most n cup products, you'll get above half half dimension. So that sounds pretty uniform to me. Um, okay, so how about how about the case of wrapped floor homology? So what I want to show now is that something similar holds on wrapped floor homology if of a Lagrangian, supposing only that the Lagrangian is a proper object. Okay, so we're going to appeal to some general theory of um, of so-called Calabia structures due to Brav and Dickerhoff, um, which says that if you have a category which is a smooth Calabiao category, which I haven't said what it is, but I've indicated it's some sort of category with finiteness, with some sort of duality between Hochschild and variants. Uh, then any collection of right or even left proper objects inherits what's called a proper Calabiao structure. A proper Calabiao structure is another type of duality, uh, which you can think of instead of a cat product duality, it's um, it's an integration pairing form of duality. So it's it's really takes more of the form of a perfect pairing as opposed to a cat product isomorphism. Uh, in particular, any proper, any category with proper Calabia structure has a perfect pairing on its HOMs. There's a pairing cohomology of HOM KL, tensor cohomology of HOM LK maps to K, okay, for any objects K and L in this category of proper objects. So how do you see this pairing? And is the okay, so dimension? Is, sorry, uh, yes, N is the dimension. So um, that's right. So the dimension of our symplectic manifold is 2n. So n is the dimension of Lagrangian. OK, so let's just assume for simplicity our object is right proper. The left proper case is the same. Um, then let's denote by p the subcategory just consisting of l. And let's take hom. But let me think of hom as a functor from my entire category times p to chain complexes. Then I see by properness of of L, um, this HOM pairing lands in perfect complexes again, instead of all just all chain complexes. Uh, therefore, as before, by a version of the Shklerov pairing, you get a pairing between the Hochschild homology of C and the Hochschild homology of this subcategory to K. Okay, so this is a an, another wedge and integrate pairing. Uh, but now you're not assuming your ambient space is compact, so to speak, but you have some compactly supported forms or something like that. That's maybe the way to think about it. So you're you're integrating compactly supported forms. Uh, now, okay, maybe I can say more about what a smooth Calabia structure is. Well, a smooth Calabia structure, or more precisely what I'll talk about is its weak smooth Calabia structure shadow. Um, it, so this weak smooth Calabia structure on such a smooth category is an element. It's simply an element in Hochschild homology, which you could think of as a fundamental class or holomorphic volume form. And it induces by cap product an isomorphism between Hochschild cohomology and Hochschild homology um, 
but not, not just with diagonal coefficients, with coefficients in any bimodule. You, you should think of this as inducing an isomorphism between cohomology and homology with twisted coefficients for any twist. That's maybe one way to think about it. Um, and my thesis shows that um, you can take the holomorphic volume form given by the preimage of one under the open closed map, and that actually gives you such a structure. Okay, that's a maybe more precise version of what was in my thesis. Um, so, so you have an element living right here. So what you can do is you can pair against it to get a map from the Hochschild homology of your category of proper objects to K. Um, now you could get a, a, an induced pairing on the object L by just taking, um, if you have a pair of elements, um, you know, X in HOM LL and Y in HOM LL. First, I mu to them, I take their product. I get an element in HOM LL again. Well, HOM LL includes um, homologically into Hochschild homology. It's the zeroth order term. It's the zero length term, it's a subcomplex. And then I look at its image here and I integrate against omega okay, to get an element k. So this is a pairing. Um, so all that remains to check um, are two things. There's an algebraic fact you need, uh, which is that, well, um, so you want to check that this pairing fits into some sort of snake relation okay, with the co-pairing you had geometrically defined. Okay. So to check that, there's an algebraic fact first, which is that if you have a weak smooth Calabi-Yau structure on a category, um, that element omega in, induces naturally an algebraic co-pairing for any pair of objects. Okay, so that co-pairing is a consequence of this weak smooth Calabi-Yau structure. Um, and moreover, uh, now it seems more believable that for that co-pairing, which is a consequence of omega, um, the co-pairing satisfies the snake relation with the pairing defined above. Uh, less surprising because the pairing was also constructed using this Calabi-Yau structure. Now, this is a, a bit technical of an, but it's a purely algebraic fact. Okay. Um, then there's a geometric fact you need, which is that on the rap fukai category equipped with its geometric weak smooth Calabi-Yau structure, uh, well, we have this geometric co-pairing and the claim is it coincides with the algebraic one, okay? So if you take the algebraic co-pairing induced by this particular element, it recovers this count of disks with two outputs, okay? Um, this is implicit in my thesis um, in the sense that, okay, so maybe I can say more words about that because I actually have some time. I'm, I'm actually near the end of what I was planning to say, but I had, I had a few bonus moments, so I'll, I'll say those. Um, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll describe why this is true in a minute. But if you believe all that's true, then you learn that if you have a proper object in, in the Rapfukai category, um, there is a pairing, you get a pairing on rap floor homology that's compatible with, meaning it satisfies a snake relation with the geometric co-pairing, okay? So by A, you get a snake relationship with the algebraic co-pairing, and then by B, you get an equality of algebraic and geometric, okay? Um, but you, you get more than that because uh, you have a degeneracy lemma for the geometric co-pairing. Um, but by the equality of geometric and algebraic co-pairings, you get a degeneracy property for the algebraic co-pairing. And this property, it turns out, you can check is inherited by idempotent sum ends uh, and maybe more. Um, and it implies any such sum end in, um, in perfect modules must be non-proper or zero. Uh, so since I have a little bit of time remaining, I will say a few words about um, how to define the algebraic co-pairing and how to see it's the same as the geometric co-pairing. Uh, give me a moment here.
So first of all, how do we define the algebraic co-pairing induced by such a holomorphic volume element? If all the okay. non-compactness of L came so far, I may, I may be missing. Ah, yeah. So where did non-compactness of L come? Non-compactness of L, um, so, so if L is proper, um, then there exists a pairing fitting to the snake relation. Um, that implies the co-pairing is perfect. Um, that implies, you, now you need a degeneracy lemma. This is the, the version of Ritter's statement I proved, uh, sorry, that, I, that I sketched at the beginning of the talk. Um, this degeneracy lemma requires x, you know, um, x exact Liouville or L exact and all components non-compact, okay? So the statement is that the degeneracy lemma says in the, for the Lagrangian case that on a Lagrangian, which is exact and all its components are non-compact, the co-pairing can only be perfect if L is zero, okay? Uh, why did it require non-compactness? Eventually we had to use the fact that the map from compactly supported to ordinary cohomology was zero and topological degree zero. That, that's every component of L is non-compact. Of course, for compact Lagrangians, there's no problem, right? You can construct a pairing even geometrically and it's a perfect pairing. It's not a zero object. There's no issue. So, so we had to use non-compactness somewhere to learn something. And, and we used it precisely in calculating something about this map in, in the, the Lagrangian analog, but thanks for the question, yeah. Uh, so, how do you get this algebraic co-product? Well, capping with omega induces an isomorphism between Hochschild cohomology um, of C. I'm going to take a particular set of coefficients, not diagonal coefficients. I'm going to take coefficients in the bimodule HOM of blank L tensor HOM of L blank. This is the Yoneda bimodule um, of LL. Sometimes you might call this uh, Yoneda LL. Um, and cap product induces a nice morphism between this and Hochschild homology of the same bimodule, which by the way is the same as just HOM LL. Okay. Um, you can invert this isomorphism. You get a map this way. And there's a canonical element here called identity, right? Every, every um, object has an identity morphism cohomologically. So you just take its image, you get an interesting element here, okay, uh, of degree n. Uh, and now, anytime you have an element of Hochschild cohomology, you can take its zeroth order term. That's a natural map from Hochschild cohomology of CB to B of KK for any object K, okay? um, or at least cohomologically. Uh, and so if you do that here, uh, you, you take this element, you restrict a zeroth order term for the object K, you get an element of HOM KL tensor HOM LK cohomologically, and it has degree N. This is the algebraic co -bearing. Okay. Um, it, in my thesis, um, I proved that an inverse to cap product, which is what we need here, we need an inverse to cap product. Um, so actually can be defined geometrically. By counting certain disks. Okay, so we, what we want is a map from HOM LL or maybe HW, I should say, um, to um, Huxley cohomology, which you can think of using the bar resolution as linear maps from a k-tuple of composable elements to a pair of elements. Okay, so I, I want to for every x, I want to produce a map from HOM x. Uh, for, for every element of HOM LL, I want to produce a map from HOM, the, you know, the tensor of HOM of a composable sequence to HOM of the, the, the left endpoint, comma L, tensor HOM of L, comma the right endpoint. Okay. And the way I get such a map is by counting disks like this with input x, uh, a bunch of additional inputs corresponding to these inputs here. Uh, and then two outputs, okay? So this is the count. Um, if you plug in the identity, 
uh, or a representative thereof, and you look at the length zero piece, so k equals zero, um, well, that looks very much like the coproduct, right? I just have, um, I'm just looking at uh, one input, two outputs, but now the input is an identity. Um, so the usual gluing formula says that I can just forget the identity and put a marked point with no constraint, right? So uh, this is the same as counting maps from an unstable domain with two outputs. Okay, and that's precisely the moduli space appearing in the co-pairing. Okay, um, I think I'll stop there for I'm questions. Sorry, is Thanks it, very much. Just, oh, good. Uh, sure, no problem. Is it clear that this geometric description is the same as the algebraic one you gave before? I'm missing something. Uh, yeah, good question. So, uh, so it's not clear unless you know this fact from my thesis that inverse to cap product is this count. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, so that's a fact I'm citing from my thesis. And now, yes, once you know that inverse to cap product is this count, then then you can sort of uh, then you can say, oh well, then let's take this count. Yeah, I can replace cap cap omega inverse with the count below, and then plug in the identity, restrict the length zero, and I get precisely the co product, the co pairing rather. Um, so uh, yes, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Uh, so let's thank the speaker for this great talk. Any questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, uh, great. Uh, thanks for that talk. Uh, I may be asking a question that's already been asked, but I don't know uh, because I'm sort of don't understand the material maybe sufficiently well. I noticed when you were discussing Shkliarov's work that you slipped in an instance of um, the Kuhner theorem for Hochschild homology. Yes, um, and so that's true. I was trying to think that through and I decided that that must be the allenberg zilber theorem, or at least part, half of, at least half of the allenberg zilber theorem, in a sense, that you're using some complicated operation from the world of, in fact, simplicial modules. So I'm curious, so my question is, does that have a realization geometrically? Um, that is a good question. Let me think about that for a minute. It, you know, it's interesting. There are, so indeed, as you say, the, the Kunith formula does use this eilenberg zilber type, um, these eilenberg zilber type maps. Um, by the time you get all the way down to K, so what you do is you, there are some complicated formula, but then you sort of map it to Hochschild homology of perf K, and then right. you sort of just extract out the length, the length zero piece from that by like some sort of taking some sort of, you know, um, okay. trace. So you lose all of those formula in the final expression. I see. Uh, so, so I'm, you're not using the contraction for Hochschild complex of perfect complexes, but it's implicit, maybe. It's implicit, absolutely. <clears throat> so, yeah, so, so there's a there's a remains oh, in a yes, way. Uh -huh. Can one see that homotopy or any of these homotopies by I'm you know by some explicit some. <coughs> Um, I'll, yeah, I'll it, it, it's possible. I, I I would need to think about it. I mean, I know eilenberg zilber maps. Uh, certainly, you can see them appearing geometrically oh, in Fleur theory. Okay. Um, so so you can you know at, at least one of the ways. You know, one of the ways you involve inserting degeneracies everywhere, and yeah. that way sort of corresponds to plugging in. You know, if, if you have a, a Hochschild chain in the tensor product, you you plug in units yes. uh, essentially, and and yeah. you can you can realize what that means geometrically when you count disks. Oh, uh, plugging in units corresponds to, you know, forgetting uh, a given mark point or, or putting no constraint, empty constraints. Oh, so you, yeah. you can definitely see some of this Fleur theoretically. Um, and, and I had used some of that in my thesis, in fact. Okay, thanks.
Any other questions? I silly question. I know it won't be true, but for instance, like this Calabia structures, etc., that you use, when do they also exist when you have a stop? I guess there's no. Yeah, uh, not a silly question at all. So you can ask what about um, what's happening. So I, I worked exclusively here with Weinstein manifolds or Liouville manifolds, but not Liouville sectors or Weinstein sectors or stopped Liouville manifolds. Um, and you can see pretty rapidly that, um, that the theorem is false if you add a stop, right? So for instance, Lefschetz thimbles, uh, you know, are often non-zero objects with finite self-homs, even though they're non-compact Lagrangians, right? So, so you can see that some additional hypotheses might be necessary. Um, this level of Calabia structure won't appear except under special cases. Okay, so sometimes um, manifolds with stops have Calabia structures. So I maybe just want to point out some simple things. So for instance, if I have X a Liouville manifold, I can stabilize. Maybe let's let's just say Weinstein for, for simplicity. If I stabilize in the world of stopped Weinstein manifolds, I'm multiplying by the stop C with two points, right? Um, these are equivalent from the point of view of Fleur theory. Uh, so in particular, even though the right side has a stop, it also has a Calabia structure. Uh, except it has a Calabia structure of not the dimension equal to the current dimension, it's dimension one less, okay? So this implies, okay, um, so this is 2n plus 2, this implies that the category has a Calabia structure of dimension n. Uh, but that's not completely obvious from the category itself. You have to do some work to recover it. Okay, so, so, um, but um, recovering so, is geometrically recovered. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, this is kind of analogous to taking a, a manifold, a compact manifold, and multiplying by an interval. Right. If you take a compact manifold and multiply by an interval, that compact manifold had Poincaré duality. If you multiply by an interval, you'll see that Poincaré duality appearing in the Poincaré duality rel boundary of, of the manifold cross I if you think hard enough about what all the terms are. It's this type of thing that we're doing categorically now. Um, so, okay, I didn't answer your question completely. All I want to say is there's some sort of, you know, relative or non calabia structure, um, you know, akin to having manifold with boundary going on in these cases. And in some cases from that, you can extract calabia structures, but the uh, extent to which you can or the hypotheses under which you can are, are not completely understood in generality to my knowledge. Hi, Shio. Uh, since you mentioned these relative structures, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Hello. Uh, I wanted to ask if you think there's a, some, some relative version of your alternative statement saying that perhaps W of X is not zero non proper, but has it only has things that uh, come from the boundary or. Yeah, uh, I do. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk about it. I, okay. I don't, uh, I don't know what the precise statement is, but I, I do expect a relative version of this alternative. Okay. It would require more hypotheses than just being non-compact though, of course, as I mentioned. I see. Thank you. Oh, uh, so, you know, you might ask with a stop, what is the right criterion that guarantees non-proper answer zero, right? So, so you might imagine there's a more generalized criterion, which is not as simple as L being a non-compact exact Lagrangian, right? Because for thimbles uh, in the Foucault-Seidel category of a leftist vibration, they're proper, but non-zero. So, so what condition is not satisfied by thimbles that guarantees non-properness or zero? But if you, for instance, as you know, if you impose an algebraic uh, Calabria condition, would that imply uh, anything? Uh, if you know Calabrianus the way I've stated it, then yes, it would. But we we know that that doesn't hold for you know, for instance, Foucault-Seidel categories. So, you, but what does hold is some sort of Calabria rel boundary condition that Alex, I believe, was. Uh, mentioning. So the question is, in such a situation, 
what hypotheses do you need beyond non-compactness to, uh, to guarantee non-properness or vanishing? So what does uh, Calabria Gel boundary mean to? Uh, Calabria Gel boundary, it, I mean, what, what can I say? It, it means that there's a volume form on, you know, it, it says that the fundamental class lives in homology Rel boundary instead of homology. So, so you think of the boundary as another category. Okay, so instead, right, so there's a boundary category. Uh, this is and you want fiber in the case of luscious vibrations or something? For instance, that's right, that's right. And you want omega to live here for a relative Calabia structure. Okay, this is the weak version, as I said. So there's there's a pair of categories. There's a boundary inclusion functor between them, and you're looking at homology rel boundary in a simple sense. I have a comment about the cotangent bundle case. So ah, please yes. I I think so. In your so first first page, you mentioned something about like homology of loop space. Right? Yes, being infinite rank, and I think that in some cases it is known. So, so, so uh, yes, I, I, I omitted that from uh, this version of the talk, but indeed, uh, I, I agree with you. What I meant to say is it's not that it's unknown in general. It's known for very, very large families of manifolds. So, of course, it's known um, if Q is simply connected. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, or, or, or nilpotent by rational homotopy theory. Um, also, if, um, you know, pi one of Q has infinitely many conjugacy classes, Well, then, then conjugates of classes of pi one are H naught of the free loop space. So therefore, of course, H naught is infinite. So H n is infinite. Uh, what, what I meant is outside of these cases where we have these tools, my understanding, I'd be, I'd be happy to be wrong. I, I looked as much as I could, but if anyone knows, uh, I'd be very interested to hear. Um, but my understanding is uh, the standard tools don't work in the you know, finite fundamental group non-nilpotent case. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks very much again.